بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليم كثيرا أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة as it has been announced, tonight's lecture is about one of the tremendous companions of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdurrahman Ibn Auf. May Allah be pleased with all of them. And before we begin, most and many people know Abdurrahman Ibn Auf by the famous story of when he made hijrah to Al-Medina and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam paired him with his brother Sa'd Ibn Rabi and he offered to divorce one of his wives and to give him half of his wealth. May Allah be pleased with them. That's the blueprint of the akhuwa that the companions were upon, Ridwanullah Alayhim, and many people know Abdurrahman ibn Auf by this incident. And it's an authentic incident, and no doubt, looking at it, it is an amazing haditha that transpired. But people don't know that Abdurrahman ibn Auf has a lot of other virtues. And one thing that I want to happen when you leave the masjid today, inshallah, after the dars, is that I don't want there to exist anyone from amongst you who looks at Abdurrahman ibn Auf as being from the second tier companions, not to mention the third tier or the fourth tier. The companions of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are not all equal. Allah is pleased with all of them. All of them will be in Jannah. But they're not all equal. The prophets and the messengers, sallallahu wa sallam alayhi ajma'in, are not all equal. So what we won't, we don't want to happen when you leave this masjid tonight for the rest of your life as a Muslim, inshallah, we have to see Abdurrahman ibn Auf as being on the first tier of the companions, radiallahu anhu. Some of us look at Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and we put them on the first tier. May Allah be pleased with all of them. And if there was anyone that occupied the first tier, it's them. But Abdurrahman ibn Auf is not far from those four companions. They are the Khulafa al-Rashidun, and they are the best human beings after the prophets and the messengers. No doubt about that. First Abu Bakr, and then Umar, then Uthman, and then Ali. But Abdurrahman ibn Auf is not far from them in his sacrifices, in his virtues, in his mizan, his, his weight in the scales of al-Islam. He is a tremendous companion. So again, I want to repeat that. Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he's not better than Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. I didn't say that. But he is not far from them in terms of virtues. And they are extremely virtuous. We even have to go a step further. And we have to say, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, may Allah be pleased with him, is a byproduct of the efforts of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. It's really important that we've spoken about Abu Bakr as Siddiq and the special position that he has in this religion. Abdurrahman is a byproduct of Abu Bakr. May Allah be pleased with them. And that those 10 people who have been promised paradise, those 10 people, by the will of Allah, جل, by the qadr of Allah, جل, the virtues of Allah, half of them became Muslims as a result of the da'wah of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, which is in his scale heavy. 
So he gave dawah to Uthman ibn Affan. He gave dawah to Az Zubair ibn Awam. He gave dawah to Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. And he gave dawah to Talha ibn Ubaidillah. And he gave dawah to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Those are five of the ten people promised Jannah. They came into Islam by Allah's permission through the dawah of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And it's understood why Abdurrahman ibn Auf would accept the dawah of Islam from Abu Bakr. And this is important. And that is, Abu Bakr was very well known amongst the Quraysh for many things. And one of the things he was well known for was money and being a businessman and being honest amongst many other things. And Abdurrahman ibn Auf in Mecca was the same way. He knew Abu Bakr and they knew each other. So when Abu Bakr gave him dawah, it was easy for Abdurrahman ibn Auf to embrace the deen. So that's the second thing we want to mention, that those five from the Ashartu Mubashireen, they're from the khairat of the dawah of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And I think someone mentioned when we talked about Ali ibn Abi Talib, from Ali ibn Abi Talib's weight in the Mizan, is the fact he's the father of Al-Hassan and Hussein. So the child is going to give his rewards to the father, as we mentioned here many times. The human being will get what he strove for. And the Prophet said about the ayat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna awladakum min sa'yikum. You went, you found a woman, got married to that woman, you had children, whatever your children do, you're going to get the reward. If they make salat, if they fast, if they make umrah, they make hajj, they wear hijab, they're on the sunnah, you'll get that reward. The point I'm trying to make here is a person's mizan can be heavier because of the people around him. In the case of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and today's talk is not about him, but I would be remiss not to bring that to your attention. Half of the ten people came into Islam, and from them was Abdurrahman ibn Auf. The Imam read an ayah today from the virtues of Abdurrahman ibn Auf from Surah Al-Baqarah, what Allah Ta'ala mentioned, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ لَا يُتْبَعُونَ مَا أَنْفَقُوا مَنًّا وَلَا أَذَى لَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ إِنْ بِرَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Those people who spend their money in jihad فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And then after spending their money, they don't follow it up by reminding people and saying, I gave you that money or by harming people, like you know, the Mujahid, he gave you the money and he harmed you. Allah went on to mention, those people who do that, they will get their reward from their Lord. And Yom Al-Qiyamah, they won't be afraid and they won't be sad. From those ulama of the tafsir of the Quran, they said that this ayat was revealed because of Abdurrahman ibn Auf. All of the money that he spent in the cause of Allah Azawajal to prepare those people who didn't have enough to go out to wage war in Al-Islam. So that's from his virtues. The people sitting here, there's not a single person from amongst you that an ayat was revealed because of you, bi'aynik, you yourself, no one. But those companions, Radwan Allah alayhim, there are, they, the ayats have been re re revealed, sent down because of all of them and because some of them have specific cases which shows the virtue of the person. Because that ayat and the understanding of that ayat and the application of that ayat is going to be there until Yom Al-Qiyamah. So that's one of the virtues of Abdurrahman ibn Auf. That ayat of the Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed describing him and people who are like him. But his name is the name that comes up. In addition to that, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, Ridwan Allah alayhim, he was from the Sabiqeen al awwalim to Al-Islam. Allah Ta'ala mentioned, وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Those people, Allah Ta'ala gave the book, and he made them mustafeen from them, are the ones who are Sabiqun بِالْخَيْرَاتِ Abdurrahman ibn Awf was a giant amongst giants. 
He was a unique individual amongst other unique individuals who his story shines. He was a tremendous companion. So from those people who accepted Al-Islam from the beginning was Abdurrahman ibn Auf. There was a time he constituted a percentage of Al-Islam because the Muslims were only few, and he was one of those people who were special in that way. Those companions who accepted Al-Islam after the Fath of Mecca are not like those companions who accepted Al-Islam at the beginning. Just like our community, the people who are Muslims today and we become Muslims born and raised in Islam, we're not like the community of Muslims who were the first people, Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'in. Our religion, we owe a debt of gratitude to all of them. And those first companions, those who accepted Islam after them, they owe a debt of gratitude to the ones who preceded them. And from them was Abdurrahman ibn Auf. So he was from those people who were uppermost from the uppermost. وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُمْ Allah is pleased with Abdurrahman ibn Awf, as he's pleased with all of the companions. No matter what they did, Allah Ta'ala has forgiven them, as you're going to see, inshallah. As it relates to Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he was one of those few companions who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fought in a number of battles. There's a lot of ikhtilaf between the scholars of Al-Islam, the muhaddithin, as well as the historians, the mu'arrikheen. How many wars did he fight? One of the companions, his name is Zayd ibn Arqam. May Allah be pleased with him. He said, I participated in all of the battles and I participated in 19. But the Prophet had more than 19 battles. That is what he understood. That was what he came to be upon. Scholars said that he participated in about 25 battles the Prophet had. 25. Abdurrahman ibn Auf was in every single one of those battles. And that's big. Not every companion was in every single battle. And this is what the scholars of Al Hadith used to say about those companions. And this is why we don't curse them. We don't have anything in our hearts against any of them. Any of them that made a mistake, Allah is pleased with them because of this ayat and others. Those scholars used to say that the dust, the dust that used to get collected in the nostril of one of those companions who was walking in jihad, you and I will never be able to do anything in Al-Islam to equal that dust because of the difficulty that they used to go through during that time. The Prophet told those companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La tusubbu ashabi fa walladhi nafsi bi yadihi. لو أنفق أحدكم مثل أحد ذهب مع بلغ مد أحدهم ولا نصيفة. Don't curse any of my companions. Don't curse any of them. Don't have any animosity, any problem in your heart towards any of them. He said, I swear by Allah, the one who hands my soul is in. If any of one of you were to spend the size of Mount Uhud in sadaqa in gold. It would not equal a mudd of what one of them did or half of a mudd. Those scholars of the past, the muhaddithun, went a step further in clarifying this issue and its importance. They said, and I repeat, the dust that was collected in the nostril of one of those companions, nothing you can do is going to equal that. And no one else. The companions are on another level. The Mahdi is not on the level of the companions. The companions are part of this deen. We believe in the kitab of Allah, the authentic sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we have to add on to that, and we're going to understand and practice our religion the way those companions did. It's not enough to say the Quran and the sunnah because many people say that, and they have different understandings of what that Quran and the sunnah is saying. So Abdurrahman ibn Auf, Ridwanullahi alayhi, he participated in all of the battles, and in addition to that, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, may Allah be pleased with him, 
he made the two hijras in Al Islam. Not one, but the two hijras. So if the Muslim knew about the manzila of the mujahideen and the jihad in Al Islam, all of those ayat and ahadith tantabiqu an Abdurrahman ibn Awf. That's on Abdurrahman ibn Awf. In Allah ashtara min al mu'minina anfusuhum wa amwaluhum bi anna lahum al jannah. That is specifically on Abdurrahman ibn Awf. Because one of the special qualities of him is what we don't have a lot of today, and that is Abdurrahman ibn Awf combined having money, having money, wealth, and being grateful and thankful to Allah. Shakir, practicing his religion, although he had wealth, he wasn't arrogant. All of those ayat about the virtues of jihad and the mujahideen, they are on Abdurrahman ibn Awf because he made the greatest jihad. He made the jihad with the Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And all of those ayat and all of those ahadith that talk about the virtues of hijra, they are on Abdurrahman ibn Awf. وَمَنْ يَخْرُجْ مِنْ بَيْتِهِ مُهَاجِرًا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ يُدْرِكُ الْمَوْتِ What's the rest of the ayat? What's the rest of the ayat? His reward is upon Allah. The Prophet said about the jihad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-hijratu, about the hijra, al-hijratu, tahdimu ma kana qabluha, if a person were to make hijra, it wipes away and destroys every sin that the person made prior to that. That's Abdurrahman ibn Awf going from Mecca to Ethiopia, coming back, and then leaving Medina, Mecca, and going to Al Medina, radiallahu anhu, and on the rest of the companions of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. From those qualities of Abdurrahman ibn Awf, is that Abdurrahman ibn Awf ikhwani at the death of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu. Umar was about to die. And everyone knows that Umar was a tremendous personality in al-Islam, his understanding of the deen, his strength in taking the responsibility of the khilafah. When he knew he was going to die, he said, I want to choose a leader for the Muslims after me when I die, inshallah. I'm going to choose six people. They're going to sit together and they're going to be the consultation body, the shura. And these six people would determine and decide who's the khalifa after me. When we look at those companions and how they are and what they did, things like this make us understand that decision of Umar shows you the level of Abdurrahman ibn Awf and the other five people who Umar chose and also shows you the level of Umar radiallahu anhu. When the Prophet told the people sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam in an authentic hadith that there will be 70,000 people from this ummah who will enter into the Jannah without any adab and without any hisab. The Prophet got up and he left. When he started trying to figure out from amongst them who would those people be? The ijtihad of the companions said, maybe, la'allam, maybe they are the people who are the companions of the Nabi. That, that ijtihad, that answer, that understanding goes to show how serious the issue is because that's what the companions said. The point is the companions are not like ulama today. They're not like anybody who came after them what they agreed upon, what they decided, what they said, is heavy in the scales. Umar said, I give you these six people, you choose amongst yourselves who's going to be the Khalifa. Uthman after him, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, and Abdurrahman ibn Awf. Could have been, could have been, he was qualified, competent. He was the man for the job to be the Khalifa after 
Umar. His name was in the, in the decision-making process. His name was there. But amongst themselves, they decided better than him would be Uthman and then Ali, radiallahu anhuma. So the point here is Abdurrahman ibn Auf, that's from his special qualities and his special characteristics. In addition to that, Abdurrahman ibn Auf was the only companion from the companions of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was pushed forward when Umar was murdered or when he was stabbed. In the incident in which the Persian man stabbed him at Salatul Fajr and he fell down after being stabbed along with some other companions, it was Abdurrahman ibn Auf who was in the first row who walked up and completed the prayer which is another indication that Abdurrahman ibn Auf from amongst the companions, he stood out. He stood out. During the time of the Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to tell the people, let those people who are behind me be the elders and the ones who have knowledge. Any Amr Bakr Zaid did not stand behind the one who was leaving the Salat during the time of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his companions after the one who knows what he's doing, if something were to happen. Abdurrahman ibn Auf, radiallahu anhu, was that individual on that particular day. Another indication, another sign, another delil of his virtues, his competence, his diana, his deen, his knowledge, because they would not allow the Bedouin, who's a new Muslim, who doesn't know the ahkam of Salah, anything like that, they wouldn't allow that individual to pray behind the imam just in case something happened. Is it haram for the Bedouin to pray in the first row? No. Is it haram for someone who's young, knows what he's doing, praying in the first row? No. But should they pray behind the imam? No. It's a sign of responsibility. From those things that are from the khasais of Abdurrahman ibn Auf is that he's the only companion that actually led the prophet in prayer Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And these types of issues, again, ikhwani, they are isharat. They are isharat. Like, they are things that the religion they point to when we look at those companions. When the Prophet was dying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he told the people, everybody close your door that leads to the masjid, except the door of Abu Bakr. That meant something to them. It wasn't just a haphazard thing. Except the door of Abu Bakr, that meant something to them. When the Prophet died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Abu Bakr stood on the member on the second step, nobody ever did that. Nobody. So when he stood on the second step, the optics of that, the visuals of that, it played a role and impact in the minds and the hearts and the spirits of the people sitting there. It meant something. So similar to that, Abdurrahman ibn Auf was the only companion who led the Prophet of Islam in the Salat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It happened as Imam al-Bukhari, a Muslim, brought a narration in which the Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went to make peace with some people who were disputing amongst themselves. Another incident when he was dying, he came out of his house, and he saw the people praying behind Abu Bakr. And when he went, the people got Abu Bakr's attention by making noise and sounds. And they said when Abu Bakr used to pray, he used to not look around. He would look at the place where you're going to make sajda. Not at your toes or your feet, not straight ahead, not to the right or the left, but at the place where your head is going to make the sajda. But the noise became louder where they were trying to get his attention. When he looked, he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because it is permissible for us to look around in the prayer if it's something that's needed, to move in the prayer if you have to. He looked and he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah motioned to him to stay in his place, keep going. Abu Bakr would not allow himself to be before the sunnah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, stay there. Gave him. Abu Bakr backed up. The way that the people tried to get the attention of Abu Bakr when he was praying was the men, they were clapping. And some of them were going, mm, mm, and they were clapping. 
After the prayer, then the Nabi said, Ya Abu Bakr, why didn't you stay? Why didn't you say it's not for our, the son of Abu, Abu Qahafa to lead the Nabi of Islam in prayer? He said to the people, when you were praying, you were clapping. He said, clapping is for the women and saying subhanAllah is for the men. So when we correct the imam in the salah, it's the woman if she's there and the imam is not a mahram for her, she says, or she claps. But we say subhanAllah. Or we open up on the imam as some of the people did today. So that's an incident in which Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did not lead the salah. Never happened. And that two things, two times that happened with Abu Bakr. But with Abdurrahman ibn Auf, the Prophet وسلم, was on a journey and he went to answer the call of nature. Abdurrahman ibn Auf was chosen to be the Imam. He started praying with the people. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him. And the Prophet missed a rakat as well. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. That narration has been collected by Imam Abu Dawood and as Sheikh Nasser said it was an authentic narration. So that's from the khasa'is of Abdurrahman ibn Auf. The only human being who, played, who prayed with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the Imam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam happened to be the one who was being led. Concerning the other glaring virtues, and they are just as important because it all ties in. There's a companion, his name is Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. May Allah be pleased with him. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was going to jihad to attack some non-Muslims. And it was a surprise attack. And this companion wrote a letter to the non-Muslims to let them know the Nabi is coming to get you. Prepare yourselves. Which could have led to Muslims getting killed. Could have led to the Muslims losing the war. Jibril came and told Rasulullah what happened. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He intercepted the letter. He brought that man forward and said, Hatab, why did you do that? He said, because my family is in Mecca. I wanted these people not to harm my family and my interest in Mecca. One of the companions said, Ya Rasulullah, let me chop his neck off. He's a munafiq. He's helping a kuffar, not only against the Muslims, but the army where the Nabi is there. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet said to those companions, he's from the people of the Battle of Badr. Hatib is from the people who participated in the Battle of Badr. This thing that Hatib did, He's a man who participated in the battle of Badr. And it may be that Allah has looked at the actions of all of the people who participated in the battle of Badr, of Badr and Allah said to all of them, do whatever you want to do. I have forgiven you. So an incident like Hatib ibn Abi Balta is an incident that shows us the position of the companions. Because you're not supposed to help the non-Muslims on the Muslims and against the Muslims. Not even here in our community. We don't go to the authorities if we can help it. We don't take people to the police. We try to solve problems ourselves if we can help it. If you can't help it, then that's a different issue. We don't go to the authorities and tell the secrets of Muslims and get people in trouble. I'm going to encourage anybody to break the law. But I'm telling you, we have al-wala wal-bara in our religion. And it's from the most important aspects of al-Islam. And we need to get more khutbahs about al-wala wal-bara and how to understand it and practice it. But because that man had a reason behind what he did, and the Prophet heard his reason, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said about that man, you participate in the battle of Badr. And it may be that Allah has forgiven the people about a better said to them, do whatever you want to do. Jabril asked the Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ya Muhammad, what do you consider and how do you consider the companions, your companions, the human beings, 
who participated in the Battle of Badr, Rasulullah said, they are the best of my community. Meaning the companions who in the Battle of Badr are the best of the Muslims. Jibril said, and also the Malaika that participated in that war. So not only was Hatib a participant in that war, but Abdurrahman ibn Auf was also a participant in that war. And as a result of that, he has a specific virtue that other companions who did not participate in Badr, they don't have. We have to understand that, Ikhwani. Any companion who was in the battle of Badr is from the best of the companions. Those 10, those 10. Then those Muhajireen who came from Mecca and then those people who were in Badr. Some of the scholars say the people in Badr, they come before the people who are the Muhajireen. Whatever the case is, if you participated in the battle of Badr, then that is a unique accomplishment, a monumental accomplishment in the deen of al-Islam, in this religion. Another incident is similar to that. Another incident that's important in the history of al-Islam, and that is what is known as the Bay'at al-Rudwan, or the Bay'at al-Shajarati, tremendous situation. In the sixth year after the hijrah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Muslims went to perform the Umrah. Islam was growing. They're Muslims. They're the Ahaqqun Nas, Bil Umrah and Hajj and the house of Allah. They say, we're going to go and make Umrah. And when they went to make Umrah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent a representative to go to let them know he's just going to make Umrah. That's it. He's not coming to fight. They took that man's horse and they killed that man, the prophet's horse, showing their hatred. And some of them wanted to kill that man, but they didn't kill him. When Prophet Muhammad heard this, he sent Uthman ibn Affan, you go to Mecca and tell them we're coming to perform Umrah and we don't want any trouble. When, Umrah, when, when Uthman ibn Affan took a long time coming back, the news started spreading that they killed him. The news started spreading that they killed him. And this is another incident in Khwani that is strange. How the Prophet of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't know whether or not they killed Uthman. He didn't know. But when the news spread that they killed him, he took a bayah from his companions. 1400, 1600. And the bayah is, we pledge our life. We're going to give up our life for this religion, supporting this deen. We're going to make Umrah. They killed Uthman ibn Affan. We're not turning back on our hills. We're giving you the bayah that we're going to die to save this religion and to practice this religion. And that's an incident that is an important incident in Islam. It's called, again, bayat al-Ridwan, the bayah of pleasure or the bayah of the tree, because Allah mentioned it in the Qur'an, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَعِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ فَعَلِمَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ فَأَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَثَابَهُمْ فَتْهٍ قَرِيبًا Allah is pleased with those believers who gave you the Pledge of Allegiance, the bayah under the tree that we're going to die for this religion. Allah knows, he knew what was in their hearts and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rewarded them with a quick victory. And that is, after they did this issue, they did the Sulh of al hudaybiyah and that's when the tide started turning for al-Islam and it steamed rolled the non-Muslims after that. For the next four years, next three years, everything was pro-Islam, everything was going from strength to strength until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took over the peninsula. The point of all of that is Abdurrahman Ibn Auf was one of those people who gave that bay'ah. So he was a person who was always on the scene when the big things and the big issues, whenever they happen. I just want to go back and I have to make this point. The 
because we still have people in our religion that some of the basics of Islam are difficult for people to understand. The Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he thought that the non-Muslims killed his son-in-law and his friend, his relative, Uthman ibn Affan, he encouraged those companions to give him the bay'ah. And he never knew whether Uthman was killed or whether he wasn't killed. So I have to bring to your attention again, as we always do, it's another clean understanding that this idea that the Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is Hazir Nazir, or he knows the ilm al ghayb, is kalam farikh. It's kalam farikh. It's not true. If he knew things like that, as Allah said for him to say, he would have never been touched by any evil. No evil would ever ever touch me if I know the unseen. I wouldn't have had to take this bay out from these people because I know if man is okay, which he was, and he came back. But nonetheless, the bay proved the iman and the salab of the deen and the commitment of those companions, Ridwanullah alayhim ajma'in. So we can't repeat to the community enough this stuff that some of our forefathers taught us that the Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is omnipresent and that he knows the ilm al ghayb. You're making takdeeb of the kitab of Allah. You're making takdeeb of the waqi, the reality. Nobody knows the unseen except Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is one of those clear proofs. Qul. La ya'lamu man fi samawati wal ard al ghayb illa Allah. Nobody, no angel, no nabi, nabi, no one. Ma ya'lamu janud rabbika illa huwa. Nobody knows the soldiers of Allah. No one knows his armies except him. And Nabi doesn't know, unless Jibril told him, like in the incident where he went to have a negotiation with some of the Yahud who were in Medina and they were supposed to coexist in Medina. They said, come, we want to talk to you and have a discussion. And the Prophet went to have the discussion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they did what Allah mentioned, they came up with a plan. We're going to drop the boulder on them and we're going to crush him to death. We're going to drop the boulder on him and we're going to crush him to death. Rasulullah was going to the meeting until Jibril came to him and told him, they have a mu'amara. They're going to drop the boulder on you. He didn't know. That's the point here. He did not know. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And there are just too many things like that for us to continue to take this religion that our forefathers taught us that make takdeeb. It rejects. Allah says no one knows. We're saying no. Rasulullah knows. And that is a form of disbelief. And it's not okay for us to be on that. So those are the things we want to mention in Khwani concerning Abdurrahman ibn Awf. There are a lot of virtues that uh, you know about, but those are some of the things we wanted to bring to the table. The overall issue is, concerning those companions, Ridwanullahi alayhim, we raise them up in this religion. Our religion, part of our deen, are those companions. We all owe a debt of gratitude to them, and when Allah Ta'ala has made it where we didn't have to participate in any of the issues, that people look at them negatively on, we shouldn't be of the people who allow ourselves to speak in them in any form, fashion, except what is positive. All of them. All right, guys, if you have any questions concerning, inshallah, what we presented today, uh, Abdurrahman bin Auf, or anything about the companions in general, you can put your question forth. Uh, the brother said uh, about a hadith, an incident in which our mother Aisha, may Allah Azzawajal, have mercy upon her and be pleased with her, warned Abdurrahman ibn Auf about a large caravan that he was the head of or he brought into Al-Medina. 
I don't know the authenticity of that uh, particular hadith, so Allah knows best. I don't know the authenticity of that hadith. But it is a fact that Abdurrahman ibn Auf was one of those companions who at the beginning of Islam, especially, his Islam was strategic and that he took care of the ummah. And when we say that these companions like Abu Bakr, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, Abu Talha al-Ansari, these companions being rich, wasn't that they just were rich, they had the money like Bill Gates, people like that today. They had a lot of money. They had a lot of money. And they put all of that money for the community at the beginning. Abu Bakr practically carried the community on his shoulder and his family members and relatives on his other shoulder. And Abdurrahman ibn Auf was one of those people who prepared the mujahideen and who fed the people and uh, gave his wealth in Allah Ta'ala's cause. Any more questions, Ikhwani? When was his death? Abdurrahman ibn Auf was from those companions who did not get involved in the fitna that transpired later in the time of the companions with Ridwanullah alayhim ajma'in. And that's another one of his virtues, that he didn't have to get involved in concerning that fitna or whatever fitna that transpired between them. They were mujtahidun, all of them. Some were right, some were wrong. But again, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, and we hold back any negativity towards saying anything towards those companions, except may Allah be pleased with them. Abdurrahman ibn Auf died a natural death, and he was an older man. May Allah be pleased with him. Little man. How did his brother die? Abdurrahman had a brother called Aswad ibn Auf. He accepted al-Islam with his brother, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, radiallahu anhu, and he died fighting against the Khawarij. His brother accepted al-Islam, and he died later on as well, al-Aswad ibn Auf. What did he look like? You know, um, anytime I give talks about the companions, Abu Bakr, whoever it is, two things I don't do. I don't use the time going through their lineage. Like Abdurrahman bin Auf was a relative of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam down the line. Down the line. He was a relative. I don't go in and some people say his name was not Abdurrahman ibn Auf. I don't go through all of that when I give the lineage of a companion. It's kind of like the chain of narration today. We're not going to memorize the chain of narration. You do well to memorize the Quran and to memorize the ahadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nor do I go through what he looked like unless there was a, a reason for that. Like if you're going to talk about someone like Julay Bib, who was described as not being a very attractive individual. And you want to show the community that everybody is attractive in their own right. And Julay Bib is an example for anybody who people are saying this person is not attractive or that is not attractive. So if it's a reason, I'll mention it. If not a reason, so what did he look like? Allahu Adam. Did they die in the major battles? Yeah, the companions died in the battle of Badr, the battle of Uhud. When, when you go to Medina, inshallah, you'll see the battle of Uhud, the mountain of Uhud, where Hamza, the prophet's grand, the uncle, was martyred, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Musa ibn Umair is there. Julay Bib is there. So the companions died in uh, many of the wars with the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then they died in the battle of Muta after the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And many of them had memorized the Quran. So when they got killed and they got the shahada in that tremendous battle after the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, during the khilaf of Abu Bakr. But people say, hey, you got to do something about this Quran. Because look at all these companions who memorized, they got killed at the battle. 
Yes. So the Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's companions were human beings. And as Allah Ta'ala mentioned them in the Quran, Ma badduru tabdila. What's the beginning of that ayah? Min al mu'mineen rijal. Sadaqu ma ahadullah alayhi. Fa minhu man qada nahbuhu. Wa minhu man yantadir. Wa ma badduru tabdila. The virtue of Abdurrahman ibn Auf and all of those companions. Allah said, from the believers, they are men. Radiallahu anhum. Some of them, qada nahbuhu. He made the ultimate. Sacrifice. He went and he was killed. Fisa la. And then there are others who are still waiting to get killed. And they didn't change anything of this religion. After the Prophet died, they didn't do the molid. They didn't do the yarmi. They didn't do the khatam. They didn't do birthdays. They didn't change anything in the religion. They didn't compromise the tawheed. They didn't compromise the sunnah. They didn't introduce ilmul kalam. They weren't asking a lot of questions. They stayed on that religion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Ali Wasallam. Any more questions, Ikhwani? That um That hadith, the companions are like the stars. Any companion you follow, follow you will be guided. It's a weak hadith. It's not true. The narration, the chain of narration has problems, and the hadith itself has problems because you can't follow a single uh, companion in everything that he does. The ayah said, We follow them in what they did right. So if all of the companions agreed on something, that's a delil in the religion. If one of the companions did something, one. And the haq is with him, especially if it's from the ilm al-ghayb, it's our deen. So that hadith is not authentic. What is authentic, what is authentic is a hadith that says that the stars are a protection. So if the stars go, anybody memorize that hadith? Can pull it up real quick? And then it went through and it said, my companions are like stars, something like that. But it's different from this one. So concerning the companions, brother, no doubt the prophet had some companions who were closer to him than others. Some were closer than others. But all of the companions, all of the companions are... In Jannah, and all of the companions, Allah is pleased with all of them. All of them, no matter what they did. No matter what they did. So whether they were close companions, they're in the Jannah. If they're a companion who lived a long time, they're in the Jannah. If they're from Ahlul, Ahlul Hadith, it doesn't make a difference. All of the companions. So he has some close, closer than others, but all of them were pleased. Allah is pleased with them. Oh, my eyesight. Uh, the hadith said that the stars are a protection for the sky. So if the stars go, what the sky has been promised is going to happen, like Yom al -Qiyama. And then he went on to say, wow. And the prophet said, and I... I'm a protection for my companions. So if I go, then my companions, what they've been promised is going to happen. They're going to start having disagreements and the fitna that happened. And my companions are a protection for my ummah. So if my companions go, then what my ummah has been promised is going to happen. So when an ummah gets away from having those companions there with them, then the ummah is going to suffer. Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. When those people in the Prophet's Masjid, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the circle making dhikr, in a circle, and a man was in the middle of each ten of the circles saying, take the rocks and say, this is subhanAllah, a hundred times. 
say this a hundred times, and they were doing that. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud came and said to those people, hey, 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 you people, hey, you people. He said, take those rocks and count your sins with them. Because this is not what the prophet used to do. He said, if you look here in Medina, there are the companions of the prophet, mutawafirun, they're everywhere. You want to ask a question about the deen? They are everywhere. You just don't have one or three or four to go to. They are everywhere. He said the pots of the Nabi have not even broken yet. And his clothes, after he died, they were washed and they not have been dry. And here you come with this new stuff. Hazim, Naza, Yarmi, Khatam, Molid, the dhikr and all of this stuff. So the point here is, Abdullah bin Mas'ud's statement, the companions are many. The Prophet said, the companions are protection for my ummah. If those companions go, then what my ummah has been practiced, promised is going to happen. So that's the hadith that I know, my brother, about the stars and the companions. As for my companions and like the stars, anyone that you follow, you will be guided. La wallahi, that's not true. That's not true. There was a man who had a wet dream traveling. And he got up and he asked some of the companions, I had a wet dream and I have abscesses and sores. Can I just make tiyamam? They said, no. As long as there's water, you got to make a ghusl. So he made the ghusl. And then they traveled. And the sand got into his, into his sores and they fested and became poison. And then he died. My companions are like the najum. Anyone you follow, you'll be guided. He asked that question. They answered some, some didn't know. When they arrived in Medina, they told the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, the man asked a fatwa, and this and that, and then, and he died. They said that the Prophet became angry. He said he became angry. When things like this used to happen, a fatanun anti used to become angry. He said, Ka taltumuhu, ka talakum Allah. You people have killed him, destroy you. May Allah destroy you. But he didn't mean it like that. He didn't mean it, destroy. But he wasn't happy. And he told those people, the remedy for ignorance, if you don't know, is just to ask. So when he asked you, if you didn't know, don't give him the fatwa. You killed that man. So that hadith is not true. The meaning is not true. I mean, it's not true. The only ma'asum is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Okay, Ikhwani, we're going to stop. I just want to leave you guys with this last thought. Inshallah. Ma dumtum ahya. As long as you guys are alive, don't look at Abdurrahman ibn Auf as a second tier companion. Abu Bakr, don't look at him like that. Abdurrahman ibn Auf is not far from those companions. They're all first tier. They're the first, the 10 who've been promised Jannah. Are they like uh, Abu Bakr? They're not like Abu Bakr. They're not like Umar. But they're not second, third, fourth class. Abdurrahman ibn Auf carried this community with his money, mashallah, and with other than that. We ask Allah Ta'ala to put us in the Jannah al Firdaus with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without any adab, without any hisab. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put us wherever he's put in Abdurrahman ibn Auf, Yawmul Qiyamah. And may he protect us from being of those people and protect our children from being of those people who have in any shape, form, or fashion animosity towards the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whether they're from the Ahlul Bayt or they're not from the Ahlul Bayt, let us be pleased with those who you are pleased with. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على النبينا وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله